Alrighty, welcome fifth graders. So I know we worked on these notes in class, but there are some things that I wanted to make sure uh, that you understood with the notes. Uh, so we're going to go through these uh, um, again. Uh, and you don't need to worry about writing them down. I just want you to, to listen to what I'm saying and make note of any uh, additions uh, that I make. Okay. So the first thing um, we need to understand really well is this term nationalism. So before the slave trade and all the colonialization within Africa, uh, Africans really didn't see themselves as Africans. They saw themselves as the Bantu or the Egyptians or the Mali or people from Mali or Ghana or Songhai, right? They identified themselves with either an empire or a clan or a tribe. Uh, so after this, uh, after a period of being colonized and taken really you know abused uh, by the Europeans uh, Africans start getting the sense of nationalism and nationalism is just it's a a feeling of pride in one's homeland okay. um, and so you know when the tragedy of 9-11 happened uh, here in the United States, nationalism uh, in the United States sadly skyrocketed uh, because we, we felt a sense of more pride in our nation, uh, more of trying to figure, you know, establishing and keeping our, our identity uh, as a nation, all right? So a lot of what we're going to be dealing with in these notes has to deal with the term nationalism, all right, or the sense of nationalism, pride in one's country, okay? All right, so again, we looked at these, so we're, we're looking at what were the causes, the events kind of leading up um, to the breakup of the colonies within uh, Africa, all right? So one of the things um, is that after the scramble of Africa or the, the European countries coming and dividing up, uh, you know, dividing up Africa, a lot of these people start dreaming of independence, dreaming of having their own nations once again, their own tribes once again, because for hundreds of years before 1884 in Berlin, the conference that divided it up, all these people were their own empires and tribes, and, and they had a sense of who they were uh, before then, okay? So, you know, a, a greater sense of, again, nationalism inspired political parties, all right? So we actually have black African political parties rising up um, within these different British areas, South Africa and West Africa, uh, to fight against um, and to voice their opinion against what they feel is, is a travesty. And we, we know it's a travesty. Um, so Pan-Africanism, uh, this idea of promoting, um, you know, Africans for Africa to fight for their freedom, this is, this is a huge um, part of, of what is going on there. You know, we have... Um, more and more people getting together and voicing um, that their traditions and cultures st should still be an important part of this. It shouldn't be British laws. It shouldn't be French laws. It shouldn't be German laws. It should be African laws. Okay. Uh, so the, our next point down. So the colonies um, helped during World War II, and, which was great because um, it helped give those entrenched European countries, uh, a larger fighting force, more hands in the army, and so on and so forth. Um, so, you know, a lot of these Africans fought alongside Europeans and, and died for Europeans and for African Africa as well because they knew that something had to change and it was going to change. Um, you know, they're, so from this fighting, they're, they're inspired to seek freedom for their own nations and... Um, you know, eventually they, they do get this, um, but the thing was that depending upon the model of government, so like in Britain, uh, the model of government was they would say that people of Ghana would be in charge, but yet it was the Europeans who, who led them, the British who led them. Um, so it, it was and it wasn't, it was kind of like a puppet, uh, a puppet regime or puppet government. And in other areas, like in Belgium and the Congo, the Belgians just run, ran everything. They didn't give the Africans any rights to government whatsoever. So that's why a lot of these leaders weren't prepared. They didn't have the experiences for it. It'd be like if 
you went from fifth grade all the all of a sudden to college okay the amount of work um, what is required of you so on and so forth it, you, you just you don't have the experience you wouldn't be well prepared or for sports analogy you know you go from middle school basketball straight to the NBA or straight to college for that matter um, there might be a few people who could do it but most of us would not be able to all right so what does this lead up to what do all these causes create well our event is the breakup of all the African kingdoms okay or the African colonies all right and they all fight and gain their independence Okay, so if we look at this map here, we see you can see the years. They're a, a little faded, um, but from basically the 1951, right close, right at the end of World War II, um, you know, they fight and gain their independence um, up until the, um, you know, 1970s. Okay, there's a few outliers, Egypt and South Africa in particular. Um, that gained their independence sooner. However, um, it was still heavy British influence in those areas. Okay. All right. So the effect. So what is the effect of the of African nations gaining independence? Well, an effect is that allies, meaning um, our allies, who allies we're talking about here are the U.S., Russia. And even the citizens of Great Britain, all right, are speaking out against colonialism. Um, to to have a colony, it costs a lot of money because you have to feed a lot of money into it. After the World War II ended, all these economies have basically been dwindled down to nothing because of all the money they had to put into fighting. All right, so these new colonies gained their independence either peacefully uh, or violently. And we've, we've read and looked at um, Unkurma's uh, reading, his, his speech to the United Nations, and, and saw, you know, what his grievances were. And so, you know, this is how a lot of Africans felt at the time. Um, the Algerians, however, fought, or not Algeria, I should say, because Algeria was controlled by France. Okay. France didn't see their colonies as a colony. They saw them as part of France. So if they lost Algeria, they, they felt like they were losing a piece of France. Okay. Um, so a lot of this um, leads to unstable governments where eventually they are overtaken by, um, by the military itself. And because the military feels like it can, it's stronger, it can control more, uh, they do that. So they limit a lot of the rights that people would have. Um, but this also helped to present, prevent, present, prevent some wars from happening. Okay? Uh, and then finally, um, so democracy tries to come in. And it's, they're still developing countries. All right? So we know that the United States, all right, the quote unquote king of democracy, all right, either whoever, all right. Um, that's what some people say. We whatever wherever we need, um, whenever a country helps for and asks for democratic help for, for to set up a democracy, they usually always come to us. All right, but we've been around for two hundred years or so. Okay. A little bit longer, um, but roughly two hundred years. Most African countries have been around for roughly 50 years. All right, so think about that. Um, the school that you attend right now, Stanley Clark, uh, the Stanley Clark School has been around for 56 years or so. So Stanley Clark, the school of Stanley Clark is older than most African nations. Um, think about how old your parents are, how old your grandparents are, okay? That will, you know, let you know just how long you know they've been around um, these African countries. All right, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask them, um, and we will use and we will go from there. Talk to you later. Bye.